I used to sit on the curb at my mom's house waiting for my dad to show up. He almost never showed up. I would always sit there and I'd wait and wait and wait. And this, this really occurred to me as I've been taking inventories of myself. Like what is causing me to have these emotions that I'm having? Why do I get irritated so easily at certain things? Because I really get irritated when people aren't on time. It really makes me think, all right, well, you don't love me, you don't respect me, you don't care about me. So now my anxiety's up. And I mean, just a little bitty thing a few minutes ago, y'all, everybody coming in here one minute late. It instantly ignites my emotions. I'm like, all right, they don't, they don't care. But I realize where that comes from now. Because I really have been disappointed in my life by that. It's had a massive impact on how I see things. Now, people being late is still a problem. It's disrespectful. You're infringing upon somebody's time. Like there's a real reason to not appreciate people being late. But to let it get over the top with anxiety and all of the things that you know, ignite various emotions in us, we probably should figure out what those are and where that comes from so we can guide ourselves to a better place. And it took me a long time. I had a conversation with my dad just the other day, which is pretty rare, about once a month. It's really difficult for me now to get irritated. I'm trying not to get irritated. So this is kind of what our presentation is about today. What is it? Why? Why are we thrown into sadness? Why are we thrown into isolation, fear, anger? Why do we get irritated so easily? What has happened in our experience of life? What are our learned behaviors that we allow those triggers and those ignition switches to go off? Because if we don't figure that out, you know, we're just, we're floating around. We're letting our learned experiences that we don't have a handle on guide how we act through life. And I think we can avoid a lot of that. You know, every action that we do have has been, it's learned, it's a learned behavior. And I think we're going to examine some stuff and maybe through these 11 slides, we'll kind of get to know ourselves a little better and use one of these tools of taking um, this exam of ourselves. You know, these infinite energies gave us this ability to, to think to understand ourselves and we should use it. You know, how about this one? There's, we run into this, we run into this a lot here, especially when we have a, a bigger crowd. You could tell when somebody has not had a lot of affection in their life. You know, like you go to give them a hug, man, or even friends. You know, like I, we all have friends that do this little side hug stuff. Like, oh yeah, good to see you. You know, you shake their hand, they pull you in and do this because they don't want to hug. You know, is that because your daddy didn't love you? Is that because your mom didn't hug you? Or maybe um, maybe you were abused? Who knows? But until you understand that, like what kind of walls are we building if we're not able to express uh, affection toward others? Like something is going on in there. Like there, there's something stopping us because we're all social. We all need each other. You know, we, we've talked about this before. What is the worst form of torture? Putting somebody in an isolation tank. So no matter who you are, whether you hate affection or don't, you go in that isolation tank and you're coming out kind of screwed up. So obviously we need people. And if we need people, that means we also need affection. We need to be seen, we need to be heard. You know, my parents hugged me a lot. My mom hugged me a lot. My dad didn't hug me until I was 35. So I had real mixed emotions. First time my dad hugged me, like hugged me at 35, I was like, what the, what is this? Like, it was weird. And then he told me he loved me. I was like, what? I didn't say anything back. I just looked at him like, who the hell are you? So what kind of, what, what, what um, you know, how do you really even express that? Because we've all, we all have those things that stop us, block us from, loving and being affection of being affectionate and not maybe we should find out what it is how about spending too little time I know <laughs> people and I know when I was younger I had this uh, 
you in a relationship and, and your girlfriend or wife says, guy, you just don't spend any time with me. And then you're like, well, you know, I work eight, 10 hours a day and I come home and I'm tired. I just like to see, maybe we can just sit down for a second. You know, uh, I just don't have, it. You, you want me to provide all these things, but then you, I gotta have time. And then you get in this massive anxiety thing. Then you don't want to spend any time with them because then you, like it's a do, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of mm-hmm. scenario. And sometimes you want to spend too much time. You want to spend too little time. Everybody's a little different. You know, my, when we think about our relationships, whether it's our parents, our brothers, or sisters, or anything that we, so anybody that we've loved, sometimes we just wish, damn, I wish I had more time with them. I just wish I had more time with them. Some people, that's a real big trip. that really piss a lot of people off. Man, you did not spend time with me today. I wanted you to be with me today. But you get home and you're like, geez, I am worn out. All I want to do is take a shower and lay down. So then there's this big miscommunication and nobody knows where it comes from. You think you're being loving and awesome, but your partner is like, man, I really wanted to spend time with you. He must not love me. He must not enjoy me. So where does that come from? Where do these emotions stem from? How do we understand it? How do we better understand each other? How about this one? This is really interesting to me because a lot of people that I have known in my life, when they get into a relationship, if the slightest little thing is goes wrong, like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm going to be home 30 minutes late because I had to do this thing at work. And their first thought is, oh, they're out cheating. They're, they're getting late. They're coming back to me. Worn out. But is that true? I mean, maybe sometimes it is. <laughs> but a lot of times it's not. It's our own experience. You know, if you were raised in a house where your parents uh, were cheating and there was no lying and thievery, that, what are you going to grow up and believe? You don't believe everybody is a lying, cheating person. If you grew up in a family that really respected each other and showed each other love and attention and there was no cheating, you're very likely not going to be a cheater. Just probably not. I mean, you might if you're a young man when you're young, stupid, and you know you don't have any control over yourself. Most men have that problem just because they're you know, dumb old, old, old idiots. But you know, but why are they that? There's no coaching. That's another learned behavior. It's another learned experience. Not to control yourself. Not to be the master of your own ship. So why do we feel this way? I have so many friends like that. But they create the worst part of themselves. Like they allow all this ignition of fiery anxiety and emotion over something that more than likely never even happened. I've done it to myself. I've caused all sorts of problems in my life because I thought something was going on, whether it was cheating, whether it was worrying about anything. I worried about something and that something never happened. Like most people do that. We worry about things that never end up happening. So then we screw up our current moment. Pretty funny. Everybody, every single person here has yelled at somebody else. We've all done it. Everybody. I've done it. Andrew's done it. Randall. Steve, Dean, Thomas, especially Ricky. Everybody has done it. What are, what are we saying to somebody else when we do that? You know what I mean? Real. First of all, when somebody comes at you, like what, what makes us feel that that is appropriate? What experiences have we had in our life as a kid, as a young adult, that makes us think that that is a good way to communicate? Like, has it ever worked out good for anybody to do that? Like, ever? The answer is hell no, it hasn't. Like, not one time. It's never worked out better if me and Steve were brothers, and I just start yelling at him because uh, he was, you know, whatever. He said he was going to do this one thing. He didn't do it, so I just start yelling at him. That is not going to improve our relationship. It would be pretty stupid. You know, Jill went uh, went on this meditative retreat thing, and I was extraordinarily supportive. And I think she was kind of shocked that I was like, man, I'm all for it. Go ahead. Because her life experience was, no, 
What do you mean you want to go to a meditative thing? No. Like I could tell that she was afraid to ask me if that was okay. That's a learned behavior. Just like yelling and screaming is a learned behavior. It does not do us any good. Who wants to go home to that? Nobody. Like nobody. I do not want to be around people that yell and scream and get crazy upset. Don't want to do it, Ricky. Don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. So why do you do it? Like what happened in your life that makes you think that's okay? I get this a lot. This is one of my personal things. I like to be alone. Like I enjoy it. I love it when I'm alone. I can spend all day and all night in my study working and I'm just happy as hell. And when people start texting me or calling me, it just like, don't y'all know I'm busy? Like, I'm doing stuff. I don't need you interrupting me. Like, I feel that way a lot. I've been getting slowly better at it over the years. But I'm nowhere close to be a master of this one. This one gets me. But why? Why do I want to, and why do y'all? Why do you want to be alone? What makes you get in a crowd? You know, like, how about coming here when we have larger crowds on Sunday? I can tell sometimes some people feel like they're kind of alone here. And I don't like that. Like, I don't like it. We're, the purpose of Sundays is for us to develop and maintain friendships, to know that we're together, to know that if we're building this friendship so that if you need anything, no matter what it is, a friend to talk to, whatever. I always like to use the flat one because if you got a flat, who are you going to call? You know, I like for everybody to know if they ever had a flat, they got 50 people that they can call anytime they can go. Okay, well, Andrew has a catering gig today, so he's probably not going to be there. Randall, he's not going to be with him. Hey, Kevin's free right now. I'll call him. You know, like you got a big option. So, like, having people you can trust and count on is never an issue. Like, that's part of being here, but why don't people feel alone? Why are we so prone, many of us, to shut down and want to walk away? What has happened in your life that makes you think that way? Or feel that way. One of the, I've been one of the practices I've been doing is forcing myself to expand out of that, like literally forcing myself out of it. I was telling Randall yesterday. I've been working on and maybe this might help some of y'all out there. I worked on these models of how to talk to myself, to talk me into different things, and a lot of times it doesn't work. But one thing that I found that really does work that I just it popped into my head, I'm really good at telling myself, like a drill sergeant, move that ass, let's go. Like when I don't want to go work out, that feeling naturally pops into my head. Let's move that ass, soldier, let's move. And I'm like, like I would talk to myself like that. And then my whole being's like, yeah, soldier, move that ass. Let's go work out. Like it works for me. I get it. I don't know what's happened in my life. I don't ever remember anybody yelling and talking to me like that, ever, except in the Army. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. So I've been doing that some. Like I know I've had these appointments in my office and the study that's going to take away from my other work. Uh, did not include you, Dean, so I don't want you to think I'm talking about you with this one. And I really didn't want to have that meeting because I had other stuff. I wanted to put it off. And so I just talked to myself just like the old friendly drill sergeant would because it worked for me. So there is something out there that works for everybody. And I don't do it in a negative way. I don't you know, belittle myself or talk down. It's just like, hey, move your ass. And I love that phrase. Like, I love it. It just feels good to my heart and soul. Most people aren't going to like that at all. Most people, if they tell themselves, move your ass. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's offensive to me. I'm not going to talk to myself like that. But I'm okay with it. I enjoy it because it's just my personality. So we have to figure out ways to break out of our shell and figure out what about people makes you afraid. What experience did you have in your life that makes you go, eh, I'm alone in the crowd. Because you have it. There's something. How often do you think this? You know, these people are different from me, so there's a reason for that. Somebody told you you're different from everybody else. 
whether it was your school, parents, friends. Like there's a reason. There's a reason different thoughts and different people and different opinions irritate you. Either you've never really thought about it or you really don't know your position well enough. You know your position just well enough to get yourself in trouble. And everybody else that you feel like hasn't even looked at anything and they're just, they irritate you. And there's some reason. Figure it out. It's part of what me and Thomas are going to be doing on our workshop in two weeks. And this one gets me. The label of God. I've had an issue with this for about the past 15 years. Just God invokes, um, well, first of all, it's a label. God is not the name of God. But it's always, in my mind, been associated with church trauma. So I've been really comfortable referring to God as the infinite energy, the universal spirit. I mean, whatever, you know, anything but just saying God, because God was what I was told in church nonstop. God is Jesus. My God is not Jesus. Everybody else could have Jesus. That's fine. My God was not. I don't, when I think of God, I don't think of you know Jesus in a robe healing people. It's not what I think. I think there's even science has proved there's these infinite energies all around us and flowing, and we can connect to it, and we can help each other and elevate each other and all those things. But that. Every time I hear that, I have this emotion that gets triggered of being a 15-year-old boy and the bishop telling me that, if, no, your time you just started masturbating, didn't you? <coughs> God's really going to be pissed off at you. Like God's angry at you. That's a bad thing to tell a 15-year-old boy. And so I started to have a, the label of God started to really piss me off. So I refer to God as somebody else. Because that label is a trigger. I've gotten a lot better at it over the past year because I've started to understand why I have felt that way. It wasn't the label of God. It was how they presented God to me. And I didn't believe how they presented God to me. And I still don't believe that if you don't believe a certain way, you're going to go to hell forever we can't even wrap our minds around one billion years like it's impossible if we had a linear straight line for eternity one billion years you would not even be able to see it on the time mark so for somebody to tell me you're going to go to hell and fire and brimstone forever that's kind of an emotional trigger for me i think you're being separatist i think you're dividing i personally don't like it just me but i've had all these weird church traumas that a lot of other people I know have had too. And that's one of the reasons why we gather on Sunday, so we can talk about it, we can figure it out, we can work out what is wrong, so we can elevate our spirit. We can connect to the infinite energies. And we can't get over ourselves. Like we can. And it really helps when you have good trusting people to be around. Some of y'all know Antoine that big, huge dude that comes out here. <laughs> Antoine is a big dude. <clears throat> well, he told me the other night we're having dinner, and he said, I said, what is it that ignites your fire inside of you? Like just on a regular basis. He goes, I feel like I get belittled sometimes. And I'm like, you? <laughs> I'm like, you, you big monster of a man in fabulous shape, and he can just stomp anybody? He goes, I don't like to get belittled. My first thought was, well, Antron's going to knock you out. <laughs> Somebody probably don't want to you know, go around belittle. But it's weird how we can look at everybody and we never know what their emotional things are. We don't know what, they're, what ignites them. If you felt like he was being disrespected in any way, it ignited him. I asked him, what in your experience, what in your childhood caused that? And he wasn't sure. So he's going to get back to me. So maybe he'll share it with us whenever he comes back from this trip to Italy. I'm excited to, to know why. Because somewhere in big, badass Antoine's life, somebody belittled him, and it still pisses him off. And I wouldn't want to piss off that. How about feeling unappreciated? That's a big thing for a lot of people. It's good to always have somebody say thank you. When you're walking in the mall or going into Kroger or whatever, and you open the door and you hold it for that person and they don't say thank you, man, I still get irritated by that. Like when they don't say thank you, something just goes 
really? I just want to slam it back, but you can't because the little thing on the door. <laughs> You're like, man, it's, it's not so bad. It's not so bad as it used to be. Now I laugh at myself because I'll thank it. And I'm like, man, nah, okay. I don't need their thank you like I used to. Now, I, but a lot of people are. You know, they're still in that situation where they need it and they get pissed off if somebody doesn't say thank you or they don't feel appreciated. If something as little as not as somebody not saying thank you pisses us off, feeling unappreciated must really be an issue with a lot of people. It must be a big underlying issue with a lot of us. There is some part of us in our life experience in a big way where we have not felt appreciated. If getting pissed off by somebody not saying thank you, opening the door means we are not feeling appreciated. What in our experience has caused that? You might want to think about it. You might want to set boundaries with the people around us. This one used to kind of piss me off. Not really anymore because I don't care. Yeah. But yeah, are we really doing this again? You question my character? That would bother me because I worked really hard to maintain a really specific reputation to do exactly what I told you I was going to do. I've worked on that since I was 25 and finished reading The Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. I highly recommend that book. Brad's about to finish it. The, um, so that would piss me off if I heard somebody saying something kind of negative or derogatory toward me, almost like Antoine feeling like he was getting belittled. I don't want to get froggy. I go, yeah. Do you think that? <laughs> Let's dance. I don't have a problem with dancing. I used to like to dance. <laughs> not so much anymore. It's not really, a, not really something I want to do. But it is something that we've all experienced. Somebody questioned your character that pisses you off. Why? Is there something about your character that uh, you don't like? Because that's really the only reason why we get irritated by it. Is there something about us that we've done that didn't like, or did somebody tell us something that was not true that we believed? And so when people question our character, that old pain comes up and it hurts us. We might want to understand these things so we can know ourselves better. I had this one all the time. You know, people will risk, just like cheating, you know, I'll risk uh, their life, their reputations, uh, everything, whether it's drugs, alcohol. You know, I don't care if I lose my wife or the, my kids or whatever these things. I'm still going to take that other drink and I don't care what you say. I'm going to go do that other drug or whatever it is. I don't, I don't care. I just don't care. I can't remember if this was with you, Randall, or not, but we were having, having a conversation. I, I've had the tendency of thinking I was not good enough for uh, – and in the past of certain relationships. I still get that tendency every now and then with Jill. I think, okay, I'm not good enough for that. I'm, I probably need to, like if something happens, you know, she comes home and I'm upstairs working. No, nah, I don't need to go down and hug her right now. I got shit to do, I'm kept it. And I don't mind blowing that up. Like that, there's a there's a feeling and force. And that never came out. I haven't, it's never been expressed. I will go down there. I will catch it and go, what are you doing? I mean, every now and then I will not do it on purpose, but every now and then something will hit me and go, no, you're, you're, you, you need her to get mad at you. But Jill's never been mad at me. Like never, it's the weirdest thing ever. And I've never got mad at her, we've never yelled at each other. It's the strangest thing ever. Like I'm still wrapping my head around it almost every day. Like I didn't even know it was possible. I thought all relationships required yelling. Like it just seemed like that's what you do. You know, I'm pissed off that, uh, you know, Steve, so you're my big brother. You know, why wouldn't I yell at you every now and then? Isn't that what people do? You know, the, oh, I'm not good enough. I need see Steve to see me. I better yell at him some. It's weird. So there's something inside of me that makes me feel like I'm a little unworthy and I'm all right to uh, destroy this relationship. I don't know what it is. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm going to. I don't know when. I hope I figured it out before I'm dead. But, you know, I hope so. But we all have them. So we have to explore ourselves and figure these things out. What is it about ourselves? All of these things. That's why Thomas is this workshop in two weeks is going to be so much fun. Is these things can help us 
change. We can move. We can deviate. We can step aside. We can understand that, hey, just because my dad didn't show up for me doesn't mean Andrew's not going to show up for me. doesn't mean Randall's not going to be here when he says he's going to. Thomas said he was coming today. Guess what? Thomas is here. Brad told me. I, didn't even, I don't think I talked to Brad yesterday, but he said he was coming. I didn't need to talk to him. Brad told me he was coming. So why do I still get mad when people are one minute late? <laughs> you know, why don't I do it? Thanks, Dad. Dick. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, we must discover who we are. It is really important. And I hope you guys watching, so many of y'all been watching, and I appreciate it. I know y'all are at home on your couch. Come out. We have good people here striving to be better people. We need to be social. We need friendships. And without them, the world is doomed. We have to stop all these divides inside of ourselves and outside of ourselves and learn how to be a better human being. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Please resonate. Come on.